So there's this YouTube video that I find myself going back to and watching maybe once or twice a year. It's an extract from Astra Taylor's 2008 documentary, Examined Life, which was a series of conversations with notable philosophers. There's Judith Butler and Sonora Taylor talking about the social model of disability. There's Martha Nussbaum talking about Aristotle. There's a really funny section with Slava Zizek in a rubbish dump for some reason. But that's not the one that I keep going back to. The one I keep watching is a conversation with Dr. Cornell West in the back of a New York City cab. And someone, I think it's the director, asks him if you have to go to school to be a philosopher. And Wes says, no, thankfully, you don't have to go to school, but you do have to have courage. Courage, Wes says, is the motiv motivating factor for philosophy for two reasons. Firstly, because examining one's life and the world around you is both necessary and hard. And secondly, because philosophy is about learning how to die. Philosophy, or to quote Plato, the examined life, teaches us about ourselves and the world around us, but in so doing it underscores just how limited we truly are. The unexamined life is not worth living, is the famous saying, the saying. But to examine it is to be reminded that one day it'll end. This process isn't an individual thing either. We're connected historically to this vast generational network of people who were once here, who have shaped the world that we live in. This can be family, comrades who have come before us. The history they made is the wreckage that we now live within. And the problem is that once you start looking and critically examining yourself and the world, it can ruin things in a way. You can't ever go back, right? You can't ever return to that state of not knowing. Something that Wes says is that when you start doing this, you become a different kind of person. Knowledge can make you not at home in the world. The existentialist philosophers talk about this in terms of absurdity. The realization that so much that we take to be just a given about existence is really this strange construction that we've come to accept. And the reason I was thinking about all of this is because sometimes it's hard to figure out what the point of philosophy or theory really is. And so I keep going back to that interview with Cornell West. For West, philosophy at its best is nothing abstract, but is about the reality of living in the history that we have in front of us and coming to terms with our own fragile and deeply contingent existence. What Remains of Edith Finch is a game about philosophy. Because it's a game about what happens when who we are, who we might become, and where we've come from, collide. It's all at once a game about living, dying, and death. So what remains of Edith Finch usually gets lumped into the category of a walking simulator. You play as Edith Finch, a young woman who's part of a family that's lived in the same place for generations. The game opens with Edith uh, returning to her family home, which is this large, decrepit, architecturally weird building in a private bay on an island somewhere off the Washington coast. Edith wants to go back to her family home, but in so doing, ends up exploring her history. The examined life takes courage, that's what Wes says, and it's no coincidence that the game opens with Edith walking from the harbour, through the woods, down a private driveway, until the house is revealed through the trees. It's a familiar scene, the approach to the haunted castle. It's taken from the novels of Anne Radcliffe. It's that section in Dracula where Harker arrives at the Count's castle for the very first time. Edith looks at the house, this physical embodiment of her history, and she admits that with the benefit of some space and some time, 
that she knows that she was afraid of the house. She still goes inside. She's been given a key, a means to get in, and the game mostly consists of walking around the house, interacting with the things that you find there. The remnants of not just her own history, but of all the people who have come before. And it's not surprising that she would be afraid. After all, at this point, the house is less a home and more a mausoleum, a memento to all of the previous generations of the Finch family which have lived and died in the very same place. I've seen lots of reviews of this game talk about it as a kind of magical realist narrative, but to me, that's not the whole story. If it's anything, What Remains of Edith Finch is a gothic narrative, precisely because it's about an attempt to deal with the past. Not on a personal level, but on a generational level too. So as you play through, you discover the history of the Finch family, that there is apparently some sort of curse that means there's an early or tragic death in every single generation. When someone dies, uh, Edith's great-grandmother, Edie, turns each room into a shrine of sorts, preserving it as a memorial. The house just adds more layers as time advances, the family just builds on top, the house growing ever taller. As the deaths in the family mount up through history, Edith's mother becomes paranoid, terrified of the potential danger in this family curse, and boards all of the rooms shut. There are some people who see Edie, the family matriarch, with her obsessions about the stories of the past and the curse as the game's true villain, but isn't it more dangerous to just think that the past can be boarded up and ignored? Forgotten about? As anyone who's read a gothic novel will know, you can't keep the past buried forever. To quote William Faulkner, the past is never dead. It's not even past, it's lived through. The wreckage of history is all around us and we live in that wreckage as best as we can. We're haunted by history, whether we like it or not. As Richard Gilman Orpalski puts it, ghosts are real and normal. What's truly paranormal is their absence. Edie rebels against this attempt to shut off the past and drills peepholes into all of the locked doors. As Edith, you can stand and look into the past, and as the game unfolds, you get to see the very final moments of all of the house's previous occupants. I don't want to talk about all of these mini-narratives because there are plenty of other videos that do that, but I think there are a couple of these stories which really underscore the connection between the past, who we are, and who we might become. There is Barbara's story, that's Edie's daughter. Um, so Barbara is this sad former child star who um, is staying in the house with her brother Walter when one night there is a home invasion and Barbara dies. What makes this all a little bit more uncomfortable is the way that this narrative is presented as a hyper-stylized comic, complete with spooky sound effects and an amazing pumpkin-headed Crypt Keeper-style narrator that turns the whole thing into a schlocky gore-fest. Upstairs is her younger brother Walter, who is so traumatized by what he sees and he hears that he retreats to an underground bunker beneath the house. When you're there playing through Walter's story, all you do is you go through a short sequence where you open a can of peaches and eat them. And you do that again and again and again. Years go by. Walter is an old man now. And as he puts it, the monster outside the door has become normal, almost friendly. So controlling Walter, you get to leave. You get to hear him be excited about the possibility of there being something new in his world other than the same gray concrete walls and tinned peaches that he's lived on for decades now. There are these maze-like passages out of the bunker. They lead to a train line. And as he's walking down the train line, seeing his first sunrise in years, He's hit by a train and killed. 
West in that interview talks about Plato's notion that philosophy is preparation for and meditation on death, but that isn't just an event. It's about what West calls a death in life, because there's no change or rebirth or really the possibility of anything new without it. Thinking about it that way, that whole section with Walter in the game hit me really hard. It's tempting. We could wall ourselves away, couldn't we? Retreat to a small, concrete, walled world and just wait it out. After all, there are monsters out there. But as Walter says, whatever's out there, I want you to know I'm ready for it. I'm going to appreciate it all. I don't mind if I only have a year left or a month or a single week. I'd be happy with one new day. And thus that short, short section is not about a dramatic irony, but about the philosophical and existential problem of what it means to be alive at all. You could spend years in a concrete box existing and you might only get to live a few brief moments as you glimpse a sunrise. This isn't just a game about walking, it's about the basic question of what it means to try and live, really live, rather than just exist. As you work your way through the house, moving upwards towards the roof, you come closer to those lives which were lived nearer to your own. You come across rooms for Edith's siblings, Milton and Lewis, and Lewis's story is one that I think a lot of people uh, remember and relate to. He's just a regular guy, likes playing video games with his little sister, and maybe, just maybe, spends a little bit too much time in his little room, alone, at the top of a house. So Lewis gets this crappy job at the local fish cannery, chopping off fish heads on the line. Without spoiling the game too much, there's this 19th century short story called The Tor Coronation of Mr. Thomas Shep, written by Edward Plunkett. Uh, in it, the titular character has a job that he hates, a boring, depressing job in the world of business. So he invents this fantasy world that he can be the ruler of in order to, to escape the drudgery and grinding boredom of his day-to-day -day existence. And that's what happens with Lewis. You start just chopping off fish heads, and as you play, or work, I suppose, and as things go on, Lewis's fictional world takes up more and more of your view. You journey on a quest. There's a kingdom and a princess, or a prince to rescue, depending on the choices that you make. The world gets bigger and more impressive, and the art gets grander as you keep chopping away at those fish heads, but the real world gets increasingly less substantial. Then there's a platform. There's a huge crowd waiting for you. Lewis, the king of this fantasy world. I'm not gonna spoil what happens, but if you've played a video game or read a novel, you should know that there are only two occasions when a monarch takes to a platform in front of a crowd of people. One is coronation and the other is, well, all I'll say is that you don't play through that story uh, to the end of getting a crown. As a player, you know how it's going to end because you've known from the very beginning of the game that Lewis isn't around anymore. And what's worse is you can't do anything to stop it. Playing it through was a really beautiful and melancholy experience. I wanted to help. Why couldn't I, as the player, help Lewis. And there's two reasons for that. Firstly, mechanically the game isn't set up to allow for that. And the second, more troubling answer is that the way life, partic particularly working life, is currently structured doesn't allow for the kind of help that's really needed. The way Lewis was made to live was part of his retreat into the imagination. It's not a pathology that's to blame here. Mark Fisher talked about this all the time, about the ways in which capitalist society treats mental health as a closed system, something deeply personal 
and depoliticize something individuals have to take responsibility for as opposed to something which is bound up within the social world and the ways in which all of us are forced to live. If anything, the section with Lewis made me think, what if there was never a curse at all on the Finch family? What if the curse was just a post hoc rationalization to try and explain the fact that the world can be so unfair? What if we aren't cursed? What if we just live in a world that limits our freedom and forces us to spend so much of our time just existing rather than living? Towards the end of the game, we come to the present day. We find that it wasn't Edith rereading her journal, but it was her son reading the very last thing written by his now deceased mother. History leads us to our present selves, and it's up to us to decide what to do with it. There's a moment we're shown as a memory uh, on the night where Edith leaves the Finch house for the very last time. Edie tries to give her a collection of narratives, texts that explain everything that's happened to the family, and Edith's mother literally tears it out of her hands. Like Edith, we have a torn apart and at best incomplete record that we call the history, that we get to contribute to, we get to build, hopefully we can pass on as best as we can. And so we need to understand it, our relationship to it, and how it mediates and shapes our actions in the world that it's formed. I'm still not sure what to tell you about all this. If we lived forever, maybe we'd have time to understand things. But as it is, I think the best we can do is try to open our eyes. And appreciate how strange and brief all of this is. Thank you.